Okay, uh, I'll call this meeting of the Standing Committee on City Finance and Services to order. Madam Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Mayor Robinson is not in the room. Councillor Louis is on a liberal absence for civic business. Councillor Stevenson is not in the room. Councillor Deal. Councillor Jang. Councillor Reimer is not in the room. Councillor Meggs is in the chair. Councillor Ball. Councillor Carr. Councillor Affleck. Here. Councillor DiGenova. You have quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. So uh, as chair of this meeting, I'm suggesting for reports that have no speakers or consideration items, we adopt the recommendations collectively in a single motion. There are currently no speakers registered for items one and two. Um, yeah, does any member wish to hold these reports for debate or separate vote? Council. Okay, so Councillor Affleck, you've asked to hold two. Uh, Councillor uh, Carr? Okay, so that's a full set. No luck on that front. Um, and I'll note that item two requires eight affirmative votes. So when we get there, uh, we'll have to do a head count. We're at seven now. So uh, the first one, contract awards for the renovations of Hillcrest Park and Riley Park. Uh, There's a number of staff present. Uh, would, you looking for a presentation, Councillor Carr? Sorry. Uh, Mr. Johnson? Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair and Council, we do have a presentation. We're prepared to skip it if, uh, in the interest of time. If you want to just go to straight to questions, it's, uh, we leave it up to your discretion. Yeah, I'm fine with just going straight to questions. Okay, Councillor Carr, you held it, so I'll let you decide that question, which is great. So thanks. We will just go straight to questions. Councillor Carr, I imagine you have some. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, I do. Um, my questions arise out of the um, uh, point made under the background section on page two and, uh, and the details of the project, which indicate that there will be a synthetic turf surface um, recycled from Hastings Park Empire Fields incorporated into this project. Um, now, there have been some concerns raised in the public and media reports around um, health aspects related to artificial um, turf. And I'm wondering if I could have a response from staff in terms of um, are, are we pursuing information about this? Um, what's, the, what's the position um, that we take or where do we get our uh, authority or information from um, that uh, can provide some reassurance to the public? To the chair, to, to councillor, my name is Tina Mack. I'm the manager of park development at the Vancouver Park Board. And the park board, like all of you, are very concerned about some of the media attention synthetic turf infill products have had recently. We spoke to the media ourselves last week, and uh, we find that there's no current scientific evidence or reason for concern at this time. Um, we historically have always counted on provincial and Canadian health authorities. Health is not our expertise, certainly, so we count on the provincial health bodies to provide recommendation and advice, and they have recently and have assured us that there's not reason for concern at this time. We'd be appealing back to them and following any follow-up scientific studies that are proposed to come out of the states. Yeah. Um, have you requested that our provincial health authority uh, look into this so that um, um, based on the precautionary principle that we're doing due diligence in terms of asking them to, um, to do the kind of the professional studies that are required to determine uh, whether or not uh, the kind of reports we've seen in the media are accurate or not. So we haven't asked them as of this date. They had a response in the media last week. We will be doing so. Great. Thank you. I, that's very good. Thank you. Okay. No further questions? Uh, Councillor Deal, did you want to move these recommendations? Okay. Councillor Deal has moved the recommendations. Um, any debate? Not seeing anyone on the queue, we'll go to a vote. Mr. Stevens is in favor. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thanks very much. Thanks to the Park Board staff for coming today. And uh, you can send around your presentation if you're feeling sorry that we didn't see it. I'm sure it's very good. Uh, New Year's Eve celebration funding. Um, we have some staff here to answer questions on that. 
Did you have a presentation at all, Mr. Dobervoldi? No, uh, there's no presentation. We're here to answer questions. And also there's uh, uh, members from the society uh, that are here as well uh, that could answer questions if there's specific questions about what's planned. Well, I think, uh, oh, Councillor Affleck has a question. Go ahead, Councillor Affleck. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just one quick question regarding, because we've got this report quite late, if you could just talk a bit about the, uh, the this $125,000 grant is really a one-time grant, and, and you talk in the report about uh, the New Year's Eve Celebration Society would follow regular processes that support the City events. I wonder if you could clarify that for future potential New Year's Eve events and what that might mean for, for the future for the City. Yeah, there, I mean, we are quite limited in the, the funding that the City provides in general to the arts and, and, and events um, in the City, and so we know there's lots of competition uh, for those funds. Um, this is intended to be a one-time startup for an event that we think there's a, a real need for and we think there's a tremendous opportunity. Um, but we're looking at this more as a, a one-time startup and then we would uh, have them uh, look to fund a majority or the costs um, through their, their own sources and, and, and look at uh, um, following normal pr procedures in terms of funding the event on their own. And the reasons for not getting to their goal for this year, um, I don't know if you can answer that question or if there's something. I think, um, I, I mean, th they might choose to answer that. I think from our perspective, it's a, it's a brand new event. Um, winter events are, are um, higher risk in, in that they're so weather dependent. And so uh, for sponsorship, attracting sponsorship dollars, um, it's harder to attract sponsorship dollars for the first year of an event that's held in the winter that is very weather dependent. And the expectation uh, for this event and what we've seen from other um, New Year's Eve festivals or wintertime events is once they begin to have a bit of a track record, it gets easier to attract um, sponsorship funding. So we, we, we accept that, that uh, rationale and uh, recommend providing the, the uh, one-year startup funding. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd be pleased to move this when the time comes. If that's... Okay, Councillor uh, Ball. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm actually delighted to see this come forward and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to the event. I just wonder if you could um, just remind us of, of the impact of uh, an event like this or, or the proponents in terms of, of tourism in the city at a sort of a low time. So I just wondered if you could have some comment on what you expect to happen. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, dur during the summer season and, and uh, uh, spring, summer, fall, where we have a whole series of events. Um, you know, the tourism industry and the city in general benefit tremendously uh, from all the economic activity that's generated. Uh, during the winter time, there's there's a lot um, uh, lower volumes, a lot more opportunity, and we think that uh, certainly this is an opportunity to generate uh, some of that uh, tourism activity, tourism dollars, and uh, weather permitting. Um, that we'll see some good crowds and. Uh, and uh, you know, as as we did during the Olympics, you know, uh, you know, in February during the games, it was great weather. We had big crowds outside, and and the time of year didn't matter. And we're hoping that this will help to establish uh, more of a, a wintertime tourism presence. Um, That's great. Well, we've had many a beautiful New Year's Eve here, as well as people out with their hoodies on and rain and and snow. So uh, I've been on Granville Street where it's been completely crowded on New Year's Eve, and it's snowing. So. I have every expectation of success here. So thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. So under the financial on page three, it says the funding for the grant can be managed through a reprioritization of the existing 2015 operating budget. What's being reprioritized? What's getting lost for this uh, big party? Uh, happy to, uh, Mr. Chair and Council, happy to jump in there. Um, are services being lost to the mentally ill no, or anything like that? No, largely um, what we're doing is um, through vacancies that we hadn't filled, um, we we'll normally would put uh, money into the surplus and, and carry it forward, and what we'll be doing is taking it out of the surplus that would otherwise be carried forward. So that's uh, from efficiencies or from vacancies that weren't filled. So we're not um, taking money from other activities that would otherwise be funded in this year. And we th are, have there, are there other priorities that have not gotten the same kind of um, look at? I mean, we have this surplus that we can use and reprioritize. Are there other things that we cannot use that money for besides throwing a party? 
Well, we are going into um, we're going into the budget process now, or we'll allocate the, the funds for next year. So you know, certainly, we will be able to allocate the resources appropriately um, as per council's direction. Uh, we did receive a motion from council to look at ways that we could support this. The, the society came forward recognizing that there were some gaps in order to be able to do it, particularly given the level of uh, security that we wanted to ensure we had on the event for this particular year. So this is a way that as staff that we saw an ability to, to support it um, without it coming out of um, you know, funding from another program. So uh, the only thing I think maybe I just add in. is when, when we look at reprioritizing like this, we generally start in, in the specific area and then work our way out. So we'd start looking at some of the event budgets and, and event areas, and then we'd go out and look at at uh, engineering and then we go broader. So we start by focusing in areas that are related um, and that reduces some of what you're um, uh, raised as a concern as you're looking at taking money uh, that would be used in a totally different area altogether. We, we start by um, looking at the account balances and the most closely related and then work our way out from there. I'm always concerned that there is reprioritization to, when there's so many other services that don't get funded or can be used for examples helping those in need or for homeless outreach or something like that. That's part of the operating budget. And somehow New Year's Eve celebrations don't seem to me to be very important compared to the issues we have facing us, particularly areas like the downtown east side and other places where those with mental illness and the addictions are, what, being short shrifted $125,000 for a party. Anyhow, thank you. Mr. Chang, uh, Councillor DiGenova. Thank you very much and thank you to staff and all of the different organizations and partners involved in bringing this forward and to Councillor Affleck for putting forward the New Year's Eve motion before my time on council. Uh, I just had a question regarding the idea of perhaps tenting a portion of this area. As uh, many of us understand, Vancouver doesn't always receive good weather and rain can often uh, impact attendance at different events. I'm just wondering if you may be able to comment on that. Were the costs prohibitive? Will any of the areas be tented? Uh, and if not, would that be something we would be looking at for future years? Sure. Uh, the event organizers are here, so maybe I'll ask if uh from Brown Lodge. Sure. Hi. Um, so there are going to be some areas that will be tented. We've got a we've got a fam pardon me, Paul Reynolds with Brand Live. Um, we do have a, a family zone that will be tented. Uh, there's a, a, a premium viewing area along the west side of Canada Place, uh, which will be a ticketed area, but there will be parts of that that are covered. Unfortunately, um, the majority of Canada Place Way is a sloping street. And in order to minimize the uh, disruption to traffic and to keep the road closures as short as possible, uh, it's just not practical in that area. And we've been directed through the work we've done with the city to try and steer clear of Jack Pool Plaza as an assembly area. So we're trying to find our feet this first year, and it's certainly something we can look at as we go forward. And, and we hope that the proof of concept will allow us to do that for subsequent years. Well, I'm hoping for a clear evening. I just. Uh... <laughs> I also just had one more question, and that would be uh, regarding, I understand that the idea of this is that it will be an event that's free and accessible to all Vancouverites and an all-ages event. I'm just wondering if there's a possibility just uh, after uh, Councillor Jang had mentioned, especially at this time of year, you know, keeping other people, especially those uh, people who fit into the core need, uh, top of mind. I'm just wondering if we may be able to sort of uh, or if the organizers had considered asking for donations to the food bank, not as something that's required, but as, as, as a way to participate and uh, pitch in a little bit, especially during a more difficult time of the year for the food bank. Sure. I'm going to let my colleagues speak to that. I'm Heather Sharp. I'm the producer uh, from Brand Live. We have reached out to the Greater Vancouver Food Bank and offered them a complimentary space at the site as well as uh, promotion to guests to bring items to donate, uh, and they are considering that, and we're hoping to have them on site as well. Thank you very much. Councillor oh, Carr. Sorry. It's okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, thank you, and thank you to all the staff and to all the partners that have brought this forward to the city. Um, my first question has to do with the fact that I'm assuming in here it's written, um, it's, a, it's intended to be a family event. Um, there will be right. So there will be um, uh, food trucks. Um, I'm hoping. I'll, uh, sometimes I have 
Um, I've heard from the public concerns that there aren't enough sort of water bottle, bottle filling <laughs> facilities in order to provide alternatives, especially for a family event. So I'm hoping that there will be something like that. And if you could perhaps describe to me in other ways, um, it's intended to be organized as a family event. Absolutely. Uh, the, it is intended as an all ages event and to have accessibility for all demographics. We have made the site as accessible as possible. We've added programming specifically that's family friendly early in the evening, including an early evening nine o'clock uh, family countdown for those. Uh, we have not only uh, a kids zone that will have, uh, it's presented by Tom Lee Music, so it'll have a music cultural uh, component as well as arts and crafts. And we have accessibility with uh, other lantern making areas, activities for, for children and families to come in and, and uh, participate together. The uh, food trucks will be there to provide food options and certainly uh, sanitary toilets and those sort of ideas. And we have made an application to the city, a request for availability of their water truck so that they have their complimentary water refill opportunity as well. The premium ticketed viewing area is also an all ages family focused area so that those that might need a little more a comfortable place to stay longer and enjoy in and out to, to enjoy the activities and still have a comfortable place for families is also available. Great, okay. Thank you, um, I really appreciate that. Uh, one other question which has to do with um, uh, the costing in the event. I imagine that this event is going to, it, I mean, the statements here are that we're going to really provide for safety and there's a real focus on, um, as it said, a robust safety plan, um, which I imagine involves our, emer our fire department, emergency responders being on alert or whatever. Um, Normally, an organization will be paying for that um, in the price of getting the permit. Um, do we anticipate that the 125000 we're going to offer in terms of a grant in this report would at least cover <laughs> um, those kinds of costs to the, uh, to the organizations? I'm Sandy Swanigan, uh, Senior Manager of Film and Special Events through the Chair. Um, one of the purposes of giving this grant was to ensure that we had a robust but reasonable security, police, and first aid presence. We are continuing conversations on this is an unknown product. We don't know how many people truly are going to show up, so we're still talking about what we want our response to be as a city, but we're also being sensitive that we don't want to discourage or overly encumber an organizer trying to bring something during the low season because of our uncertainty. So I think this year will be very educational, and I think we'll have a good response contingency plan should things be so good that they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. That's it. Councillor Affleck, you got to you were here? Uh, Sorry. Okay, I'd like to move the recommendation. Sure. There's no other speakers. Oh, catch okay. you had questions? You went on there, you went on there, sir. Anyway, you were you weren't there a moment ago, Councilor Dill. If you have questions, then uh, why don't you go back on Councillor Affleck after that? I was waiting to hear all the other councillors' questions. Um because I've spent a lot of time working on this as well. Um a question a couple of years ago we we looked into this. Um um, we were already working on it. Councillor Affleck brought a motion forward. We all agreed as a council to support this. The organization was formed. We had the large press conference with the mayor there. And, um, and a lot of work was put into that, and then it was drawn back a little bit. And I understand some of the reasons, but I think it would be nice to have a, a little bit of an explanation of how that was reformed, brought forward again in this successful format, and how this will then leverage us moving forward in the future. Things like having, having um, a record of having the event so that we make sure that it's successful moving forward in a more sustainable way. I'm Paul Sants of Tourism Vancouver and the manager of cultural tourism. Um, one of the first, uh, we're looking at it first, let's go back two years. Um, there was, the funding fell through um, for, for sponsorship. Um, we didn't have enough time to reach out to the community. With, uh, with the board gathered again and said, the society, and we said, let's try it one more time. And this time we sat down and said, what would an ideal, great, wonderful festival, New Year's Eve festival look? in the downtown core. 
And one of the things is if you think um, what it did look, what the city looked like over the last decade was on New Year's Eve, it was black on the television set. When you go to CNN or when you look at any of the news um, uh, broadcasts of Vancouver on New Year's night, what it was was a city with no festival, no happy city here. Everywhere else you saw Paris in celebrating under the Eiffel Tower, you saw Times Square, you saw um, Sydney Harbour lit up. And now this is a great opportunity to showcase our city, which hosted a world-class event called the Olympics. And we've had visitors write letters to us over the last 10 years at Tourism Vancouver. I cannot believe you hosted a, a great, wonderful Olympic Games, and you don't have a New Year's Eve celebration in Vancouver. I don't want to go to a bar. I don't want to go you know, to those type of events. They're there for a certain demographic. But this was for a group of people who want to take their families to a safe celebration to celebrate the new year. And this year, we hope this is something that will continue on for generations. Thank you. And just, um, I, we've had some conversation, you know, I've been speaking yeah. a lot about this, um, uh, conversations around the fact that you need to have a record of a successful event in order to then bring in um, this, the resources and the support necessary to, to expand it potentially. In the that, that's correct. We've, we've applied, to, we tried to apply to Heritage Canada. We, we, we reached out to the city, to the cultural services, to various other community grants. And all of them have stated that you need to demonstrate your first year a successful event. So this year we'll have videographers out there, photographers out there. We'll capture that festival. We'll make sure we hire local artists. It's very, it's imperative. It's a local community event. So we'll feature local um, um, contributors to this festival. Um, and then hopefully our goal is in the new year we can apply for these grants and it will be ongoing for continuation. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll save my other um, question. It's actually more of a comment. I was happy to move it. I, Councillor Affleck seems to be bound and determined to, but if you have more questions, you can ask them. But I've been putting a lot of work on this, and I'd like to move the recommendation and acknowledge Councillor Affleck's motion earlier um, and comment that one of the things that's really important for the community to recognize is that the city doesn't actually produce. Did you have more questions, Councillor Affleck? You, you can't produce. Uh, comments to the chair, Councillor Deal. Sorry. So, what are you, are you continuing to ask questions? I was going. To, we don't place hold moving motions. That doesn't well, actually operate. Well, actually, it happens quite a bit. I hate to be picky about that, but. All right. All right. Then I won't move the motion. Um, I will let him move it and speak to it. Councillor uh, DiGenova, I just ask you to keep your uh, comments strictly to yourself. You're very, very diligent in enforcing that rule for other people. So, I'd like you to be mindful of it yourself. Thank you. So, you have. Uh, I'll speak to the motion. Councillor Affleck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate uh, Councillor Deal. The, uh, I think we've shared a lot of time on this, on this project, but uh, it was my motion from 2013 that sort of got the ball rolling. It was a pra pragmatic motion, uh, not political in nature. It was based on my experience uh, with my family living downtown and walking out on New Year's Eve and looking for something to do with the kids and nothing was happening, but there sure was a lot of people w waiting for something to happen downtown. Uh, so the motion was really based on that experience of not just me, but many, many people in the city and, and the region. And not only that, we look at when you're watching uh, New Year's Eve events on television, you see London, you see Paris, you see, uh, you see uh, Toronto, you see Stockholm, uh, you see Australia, you see all these cities having these celebrations. And I remember one year they actually came to Vancouver and there was, there was darkness. It was, it was CNN was running these New Year's Eve across the world and they had a camera in Vancouver, but nothing was happening. Uh, so this, I believe, uh, is a great opportunity for us to, to be able to celebrate as a city, uh, to bring, bring in the new year in a real positive way. Uh, the, the, the most the recommendation is for money, but I understand from staff and, and from discussions today that this is a one-time ask and that uh, that ability to demonstrate success uh, is crucial for long-term success. And I'm hopeful uh, that this uh, celebration will be something that we can do every year uh, safely for families and everyone. Um, and that's a crucial part of it. I think that's one of was also my concern uh, attending the random events that were happening all around town uh, that weren't in any way controlled uh, it was a concern of mine uh, and so this is an opportunity as well to create a safe environment for all of us to enjoy so I'm very pleased to to move the recommendations and I thank uh, all the staff and all the all the people who are involved in the process uh, and the DVBIA uh, uh, to, to pushing this forward it's I know it's a challenge I know it's a it's a big it's a big budget uh, and in Vancouver it's tough to find donors 
uh, and I appreciate all the hard work they've put into it. And uh, hopefully we'll see full support around the table here in, in the chamber, and uh, we can have a party on uh, December 31st of this year. Thanks very much. Councillor Carr. Yes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm very um, happy to be supporting this. I, I do want to note that it's, uh, I think uh, um, we should take heart in that, uh, um, the, you know, a measure of the success of a really wonderful initiative is that councillors are vying to move it. <laughs> so you've got the first sort of momentum there of, of uh, support. And uh, I just really thank everyone who's put their time and effort into this, you know, starting with the motion by Councillor Affleck, but other work that's gone on by Councillor Deal and certainly other... I, you know, members of this council and previous councils who were determined to make sure Vancouver does not get the label of a no-fun city. Um, and this is about, I think, a very fun event that is, I love the fact that it is at all ages, it's family-oriented, the, you know, early countdown um, to get the, the, the children in, uh, involved in, in this sort of spectacular nature of, you know, ringing in the new year um, in, a, in a safe um, venue uh, that's, as I say, fun. Um, I also just want to point out that, you know, we've, we've certainly had reports at this council table um, by the Vancouver Foundation, for example, around issues like loneliness in the city. You know, when you have public events that can draw people in, um, and New Year's Eve can be a very... T it can be a very hard time for people who feel lonely. Um, so an event that can actually bring in um, individuals and engage them in something that's with other people sharing in a, you know, in a fun event, I think is, is really important for our city. So thank you all for the effort that, that's been put into this. Thank you. Councillor DiGenova. Thank you very much. I just wanted to echo some of the comments. Thanks to staff. Thank you to the downtown BIA, all of the partners involved, to Brand Live, uh, everyone who's come together. And although uh, this will require the city putting some funds in, I'd also like to thank all of the sponsors who have come together and stepped up. And that's certainly something that we wouldn't be able to do if uh, they didn't come part of the way here. So echoing many of the comments, I think that in a city that can be so unaffordable, it's great to see a fun, free, uh, all-ages event where people can come together and really celebrate the New Year in Vancouver. I'm really excited about that. I'd just like to thank everyone, and I'd also like to thank Brand Live for reaching out to the Food Bank. I know that it's also, uh, as Councillor Jang had said earlier, we certainly, uh, while we're celebrating, have to keep people who might not have as much to celebrate in mind and do what we can to lend a hand there. So that's very exciting, and I'm looking forward to seeing on CNN uh, Vancouver in part of that uh, camera shot this year. So thanks to all involved and thanks to Councillor Affleck for uh, getting the ball rolling with his, or should I say dropping, with his motion. Councillor Deal. Thank you very much and yes I'll acknowledge all political parties and people who've been involved including Councillor Affleck and the Mayor who's been very supportive and, and uh, 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 did a major sort of press event to make sure that people knew that we were aiming for this. Um, uh, I just want to mention a few things. People have the impression that the city puts on events, that we are event producers, and that very rarely actually happens. People come to us and say, why don't you do this? And what we need is we need partners. We need partners to do that because that's not the core business of the city. That's not where your property taxes go to. They go to supporting events that other people are producing almost all the time. There's a few that we've done, like Van 125. Um, so what we were looking for was that partnership, and it was hard to find. It took a lot of years. And this organization, this committee, uh, you know, we had Van City Buzz, we had the DVBIA and, and Tourism Van and Starbucks and other, or other sponsors come in, and Brand Live came along. You need a great producer. And here we have a great Vancouver-based production company that really knows how to put on events. And, and uh, this is going to be spectacular. We know you've got all the contacts for the local talent that was going to come in. Uh, and then you need uh, um, volunteers and staff. The volunteers, we know they're going to come along. I'll but there's people going to line up as soon as we approve of this to say, I want to help out. Um, and we need uh, the staff who make this happen, uh, Sandy and Jerry and, and uh, Rich and everybody who's been working on this. Um, uh, Sandra has uh, been uh, 
uh, really crucial to this. And it took a little bit of work because it was a first time event. And it's hard to get people to support something when there's no record of success. So well, I'm very, very excited. As, as uh, Councillor Di Genova said, we're going to be on the TV screens and we're going to have the best backdrop of anybody. And it's going to be something that uh, I think is going to grow and become extremely popular over the years. So I'm absolutely thrilled that we're getting over that hump of getting that committee, that organization, the production company, all the staff support in place, the sponsorships, so that we can get this first one off the ground. And I think you're just going to see it fly from here. It's going to be very exciting. We're going to become a real destination for this time of the year, which is something we have great opportunities with, with the ski season and things anyway. So it's a real jewel in our crown, and I'm very much looking forward to it. And thank you to everybody. I'm very much in support. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Events that are successful are events that serve many, many audiences and also achieve social ends and provide employment for those who really need that employment. And this particular event, the way it has been described and is planned and is planned for the future, really answers all those questions that you ask about an event. Will this be worthwhile? And I am very grateful that our city staff have taken the time to actually find a way to make it possible for us to support and lift this off because I do feel that we'll have many, many years of really successful New Year's event which actually fulfills all of the promises of a great event. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Councillor Reimer? Yeah, some brief comments. Um, I know um, People have spoken to how great it will be to see Vancouver on New Year's Eve on the news, although presumably if you're at the party you won't also be watching TV, but other people will be. Um, it is a fantastic thing for tourism, for city branding, it will be fun. Um, I know when former Mayor Owen cancelled New Year's Eve in Vancouver, it, it created a meme that has been very hard to run away from as a city back to the the spirit that I think more embodies Vancouver, which is a good, fun, community celebrating city. Um, I, I do though, um, you know, it's a big community wide event. These issues around dispersed events and community building that have been raised, um, signature events tend not to be great at that. So I don't want to lose sight of the fact that community based New Year's Eve celebrations are still an important part, I would hope, of what goes on in our communities. Um, around the city and that um, small grants and other ways that we support community and coming together in a way where neighbors are meeting neighbors are, you know, an important part of what we do as a city and this uh, signature tourism city branding event is not meant to replace that kind of activity at the community level, but happy to support it for what it is. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Well, I had no idea that there would be so much chatting over this. And um, <clears throat> I feel left out by not getting on the queue. So, so here I am, and I love a party. It's a totally inclusive queue, Councilor Thank Stevenson. You. Totally inclusive. I love a party. I'll vote in favor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, that's that's pretty exciting. Thank you, uh, Mayor Robert. Mayor Robertson. Well, I'll just add my, uh, my uh, enthusiasm and my big thanks to all the partners involved. And uh, after, after being um, nudged and chided on this by Van City Buzz repeatedly, I, which it was great. Uh, there was a, a media partner in this that took a real interest in it and kept driving it. Uh, DVBIA, uh, Charles, you and the team there have been have really been really strong and, and lots of great partners, Convention Center Tourism Vancouver, Brand Live uh, pulling this together. Um, We've got lots of great sponsors and the city staff team have done a great job pulling it together. So it takes uh, many hands to make light work and uh, we want to bring uh, the light to the New Year's Eve here in Vancouver. So congrats to everyone uh, for all the great effort to get it to this point finally after uh, a few tries and uh, we'll look forward to a great New Year's Eve here in Vancouver. Thanks for the great work. Thank you, Mayor Robertson. Seeing no further speakers, uh, I'll cast my vote in favor of the party as well. Um, so we'll go to a voting screen and uh, please show. And uh, it passes unanimously. For those present. Thanks very much. Uh, so we'll go on to our uh, next item, Rental Recommendations 2015. So this is a report to uh, 
us from the Renters Advisory Committee, and then we'll go, probably should go back to staff for analysis, but uh, I think we have Mr. We have one speaker, we have uh, Joshua Prost from the Renters Advisory Committee here as a presenter. So Mr. Prost, I think we'll treat, put you there to outline the recommendations of the committee to us, then we'll hear from our speaker. Uh, there may be questions to you, and then probably we'll ask staff to uh, take it to the next stage. So welcome. All right, thank you, Council. Uh, it's an honor to be here to speak to you today as a volunteer with the Renters Advisory Committee. I just wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about us on, on this committee and about myself as this is the first time that we are coming to you and about just some of the background for why we've undertaken this work and uh, just briefly going over uh, what we did recommend. The, the renters, and I'll ask for your indulgence if I go slightly over the, the time allocated to me, um, if that's all right. Uh, the, the Renters Advisory Committee uh, that uh, contributed to this report is made up of a dozen Vancouverites from all walks of life. Um, some rent in private landlords, others from co-ops, uh, from, from property managers to political assistants, and from a staffer at the TRAC Tenant Resource and Advisory Centre that the city funds, uh, to uh, students studying towards master's degrees in housing-related topics like zoning and Airbnb. Uh, for my part, I keep very busy as a staff lawyer with the Community Legal Assistance Society, or CLASS, in downtown Vancouver. Personally, I, I, didn't grow, I didn't grow up here. I've chosen Vancouver as my home after coming here from Ottawa. I came out to BC to attend law school. And in my day-to-day -day work at CLASS, I help low-income people from across BC navigate the legal system uh, when housing is in jeopardy, uh, whether it's a co-op member whose membership is being terminated, a homeowner whose mortgage is being foreclosed upon, or a tenant whose dispute involves the court system. I, I, I come to you today uh, with a, also with a, with a personal background in this and a personal interest. In, in my personal life, my roommates and I are being evicted from the home that we've lived in for the last decade. Um, I'm moving away from my home on Commercial Drive that's had three different owners in the last six months and it's been flipped for hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit each time. And as I consider myself starting a family, I'm asking myself questions and wondering whether there's a place for someone like me uh, here in Vancouver. And these are questions that are increasingly on the minds and lips of our generation. Um, and uh, we think of Vancouverites like Evelyn Shaw asking us to consider what those who can't or won't take on a million dollars in debt are to do and organizations like the Carnegie Community Action Project that ensure that halls like this stay focused on all Vancouverites. And we know that Vancouver has an artificially low vacancy rate. Um, we know that rental rates for, for rent keep rising. We know that most Vancouverites rent their accommodation, but that this percentage keeps dropping. So, so what can we do about that? And the City of Vancouver has been an important player in discussions about renters for a long time. You directly control a lot of policy levers that determine how friendly this city is or isn't for renters. But in this era of cooperative federalism, no government acts alone. And federal and provincial spending policies and laws are working either with or against city bylaws and programs. And for decades, the city of Vancouver has passed resolutions calling on the province to make specific changes to our tenancy laws. And we've seen calls for Residential Tenancy Act changes emerge from the downtown Eastside area plan and documents like it. And now the province has come to Vancouver asking for input on residential tenancy laws. Earlier this year, in, in a motion that was unanimously adopted by this chamber, you asked our committee to review the provincial residential tenancy system and to provide recommendations on how it could better support renters. And I'll just say that I think it's important that the tenancy system have a balance between the interests of landlords and tenants. I, I know this firsthand as I've been a landlord in the past and I've worked for a property management company before. Uh, 
And we've heard landlords complain about damaged places, delays and frustrations involved in the residential tenancy branch arbitration system. We don't want units left empty because landlords give up, give up on renting. But we are a renter's advisory committee, and we exist to try and bring a voice to a group that is often underrepresented in our policy processes and consultations. Landlords have a very strong voice with organizations such as Landlord BC. You've signaled a desire to work to try and redress some of these issues with our housing crisis. You've asked for our recommendations, and we've come together as volunteers to give you this report. We researched, debated, and produced the, and crafted uh, and formatted this report ourselves. And we've produced uh, this to assist you to act and as a statement about the priorities that many renters in Vancouver have in 2015. We, we didn't start this with a tabula rasa. We, we've crafted this by curating and building upon the work of a lot of other groups. And I, I just have a brief uh, presentation here where I'm just going to go through uh, just the, the title pages of a few of the reports that we were building upon. Uh, so this is, let's see, this is the report we've given to you. Uh, we built upon reports including the work of the Pivot Legal Society. Uh, this was a Vancouver Foundation-funded report from about a decade ago that pro provided a lot of recommendations. Uh, we've uh, built upon the work of uh, the West Coast uh, Women's Legal Education and Action Fund that provided some, some very good suggestions that the province is now adopting in changes to the Residential Tenancy Act to better support those who are fleeing domestic violence. Uh, we've incorporated suggestions from your own uh, resolutions uh, over, over the years. And we've also looked to organizations uh, like, uh, like TRAC and the BC Public Interest Advocacy Center with some of their publications. Uh, the, the great work that uh, UBC, uh, Penny Gerstein uh, did with the Housing Justice Project and some of their dialogues. Uh, as well, we thought it was important to look to the voices coming out of the Carnegie in the downtown east side uh, about issues there and in the downtown south. And uh, my, my own organization, the Community Legal Assistance Society, and some of the reports that, that we've put out over the years. As well, our reports cite some of the important court decisions that have affected housing issues in recent years and, and the provincial housing strategy. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, it also draws on some of the recommendations that have been in the downtown east side uh, local area plan that specifically mentioned and dealt with the Residential Tenancy Act. And we've, we have been influenced by, by media reports about this. Just, the, just to close, I want to say that this is, uh, this is our response to, to your request. We hope that you find this report a useful basis to consider your own resolutions and advocacy efforts going forward. And from our point of view, this is the start of our work. It's not our last word. We, as a committee, have met with the residential tenancy branch in the province, and we want to work on planning for the future stability of our city. These recommendations are not going to solve issues like a 0.7% vacancy rate, but they should reduce the frictions and tensions that exist when problems do arise. And they chart a path where we can work towards things like social justice and sustainability, and where we can also implement common sense changes. Uh, I think that some of what I heard the most about in some of the media like CKNW was our recommendations that official communications between landlords and tenants, it should be allowed to have those communications via email, that you shouldn't have to use only things like fax or postal mail to do that. Some, some of this, uh, is, is not political and should work towards speeding up the system for, for everybody. We, we want to, th in particular, uh, thank staff for their assistance and thank the council liaisons to our committee for your time. Subject to the questions, uh, those, those are my comments. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Prost. There, there are a number of questions, and uh, just before we get started, I want to say 
think uh, we'll speak for all of us, we really appreciate the quality of the work was done and the time that was put in by this group because it's very, very helpful to Council and I think will be helpful to everybody in this debate. Um, we'll just have a, a single round of questions and comments because I think there will be, uh, you know, further analysis required, but uh, we'll do that and we're on a tight schedule. So I appreciate you coming down. The first question is from uh, Mayor Robertson. Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Prost, and uh, please pass along my thanks to everyone on the Rental Advisory Committee for the work done on this uh, and uh, taking the time and noting some urgency to it uh, in, in getting this feedback given the um, pressures on renters in Vancouver, which, uh, as you uh, eloquently state, have uh, been uh, significant pressures for many years, and, and you guys, I think, did a great job of mining all of the different uh, literature, the studies that have been done by great organizations here in Vancouver about the challenges with the Residential Tenancy Act and uh, the challenges we have uh, on the ground here as a result. Um, just uh, to give Council a heads up, I, I my intention is to do a motion to refer this back to staff so uh, we can get advice on next steps that we can take as a city on this. Uh, I'm happy to do that once we've had questions and heard from speaker. Um, my question to you is, is really on this next step of it and, and the response that you had from the re residential tenancy branch, uh, the ministry and the, B and the BC government. Uh, did, did you feel like they were responsive and there's some willingness to, uh, to make changes in the near term based on uh, the work that you're doing and the recommendations you're bringing forward to council? Absolutely. So uh, we, We've met with the residential tenancy branch to talk about these issues generally. Uh, with this specific report, we have not yet uh, sat down to go over all of the details of it with them. I know that uh, their policy director has spoken to city staff and expressed a uh, willingness uh, to do that. And I would say that in general, nothing in this report uh, comes as a surprise. It's all building upon long-standing recommendations, even going back as far as the work of the BC Law Institute in the 1970s and some of their reports. Uh, and, and so we've seen a lot of responses to these issues generally. And I think that in general, we, we have also seen the province be willing to act on a lot of issues to do with the Residential Tenancy Act recently. We've seen changes introduced in the legislature and we've and some of the issues that we talk about here we are seeing responses on. For instance, this past year there's been movement to better allow low-income tenants who are not paying filing fees to file applications for dispute resolution online. Uh, that That's a change that, that we really salute. Okay, so you're in terms of of next steps, do, do you already have an intention as as a, a committee to present this to the RTB and the province, or are you are you waiting on the city's next steps, or do you guys have a game plan yet? So uh, our our recommendations here are coming to you uh, to act on, and we we will. Uh, be happy to meet and speak uh, with the province, uh, but ultimately uh, it's, uh, it's our view that we're giving these recommendations to you as the city uh, for, for staff to follow up with uh, as you wish. Okay, and that's uh, certainly helpful for us in our next steps, uh, mm -hmm. but it sounds like there, you've already got a dialogue there which is mm -hmm. helpful and, uh, and may be constructive to keep advancing that uh, if you're getting more traction than uh, perhaps other organizations including the city. Uh, you, you guys have done a lot of work on this and are, are on the pulse so uh, appreciate all the energy that's gone into it and uh, hopeful that we can actually move the needle and get some uh, important changes done in the near term. So thanks. Thanks Mayor Robertson. Thank Councillor uh, Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much and um, you pull your microphone down and oh, it's easier to hear you. Sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for all the work uh, that you do on that committee. It's um, it's an amazing committee. It's just uh, come together for the first time, which is very significant. And <clears throat> we get a lot of feedback that there is such a committee that actually exists. And then the work that you've done in this report is really very, very significant. And, uh, and, and I thank you as one of the liaisons to the rental committee. Um, one uh, question that I've had a couple of times come up uh, with people 
is a really important recommendation around <clears throat> victims of uh, violent abuse or, uh, or violence, and that, that um, tenancy agreements be broken without penalties as a result. Can you, can you talk a little bit about um, the thinking of what, the pros and cons and so on that went into that particular recommendation? I mean, obviously, for all of us, uh, domestic violence is something we want to not only deal with but uh, eradicate, but that's a long-term thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So could you just talk about that? M the other ones, um, <clears throat> I think everybody's just uh, very pleased to see them, particularly renters coming through. But there's some misunderstanding about this one, and so I thought maybe if you could get a little history in that. Absolutely. The, the issue of being able to get out of fixed term leases in cases of domestic violence or also in situations where people are aging out and are going to go into a care home uh, in the later years of their lives. This is an issue that provinces around Canada have been, have been facing and taking action on in recent years. We've seen action on this as part of domestic violence initiatives in Ontario, in Nova Scotia, and now we've seen, uh, we've seen this introduced into our legislature here in BC, and it's presently being debated in Alberta. And the general, the problem is that we, we, want, we don't want to have fixed-term leases be a barrier for people to leave these types of these types of relationships. The solution is has generally been that if we can put in place a system where where we have some verification, then there should be a way to give a month's notice and get a and get out of a fixed-term lease so that you don't have the obligation to pay out the rest of that lease or to pay an an end undeterminate amount of money. And we've seen successes with this. Uh, this has been introduced as, as a bill in the legislature and the and there's still a lot of work to be done about about that. The the province will be consulting uh, about this over the coming months about exactly what is the nature of the regime that gets put in place. What what's the nature of the verification requirements and how can we make this as effective as possible while having adequate protections involved in it? Does that answer your yeah, question? That's perfect. Uh, I appreciate that. It's very that's right on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all my questions. Uh, much, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Reimer. Um, yeah, well, I thank you for being here today. And I, I've been involved with probably an embarrassingly high number of uh, reports from resident advisory committees at this point um, in my seven years on council. Um, and I have to say, like, if there is an award for resident advisory committee, both in terms of research um, and effort put in and attractively desktop by the members of the committee, you guys really deserve it. It was a pretty amazing effort that you put into it. So you told us about the process you went through to develop, looking at uh, various reports that have come out over time and that this was intended to be somewhat iterative in addition to including um, the perspective of the rent renters advisory committee. What you didn't tell us about was who is on the renters advisory committee. So can you speak to that a bit? And I know it was a subcommittee as one of the liaisons was um, had a front row seat to the work that you did. Um, can you speak a bit to that, the kind of um, backgrounds that they come from and the expertise they might bring? Absolutely. I, I, I won't go over everybody on the committee, uh, but uh, some of the real expertise that came in terms of this particular report uh, was we had uh, one staff member from TRAC, Tenant Resource and Advisory Centre, um, Parveen uh, Katara. Uh, she, she brought a lot of her experience over the years taking phone calls from tenants in Vancouver and around BC and what some of the issues that she had identified there were. Uh, we, we also saw uh, Karen Sawatsky, uh, a uh, student uh, focusing on issues with Airbnb over at Simon Fraser University. She brought a lot of expertise as well. And then, 
and 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 then we and then everybody else on on the committee came and and offered suggestions as we went through a sort of iterative process. We looked to these reports that that were out there, but we didn't just like copy and paste all of the recommendations from them. We we went through and as a committee identified what are some of the ongoing issues. What what are some of the top priorities that we have that that we'd like to share share with you and that's how we came to I think one of the media sources said uh, 27 recommendations in here that's that's very helpful and um, just council may not remember because it's been a while since we established the renters committee but in terms of perspective I mean there, there are rentals um, which include renters, but also landlords and other levels of government. Um, the perspective that the Renters Advisory Committee took in preparing this report, was it that of renters or people providing advice on rentals in a broad sense? So the, 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 the perspective that we took was that um, we, we received a motion from council mm -hmm. asking us to identify ways to improve protections for renters so that was mm -hmm. the the name of the motion and we and we saw our role as a com as a committee of renters in this city to be able to draw upon our own experiences and and offer suggestions on how this system could be rebalanced to to better protect uh, renters we, we didn't see it as our role to try to deal with all issues or to try and uh, say that we're somehow representing landlords or property developers. We're, we're not. Uh, we, we drew upon our own experiences to, to try and offer recommendations from them. Okay. Um, last question. Um, you, you mentioned the number of recommendations. Um, I know there was some debate in the committee about whether to provide an exhaustive list um, because certainly there are lots of issues or whether to do prioritize, you know, a shorter prioritized list. Can you give council some sense of what decision you made and what informed that decision? Absolutely. So we, in the report, we grouped the recommendations into six different areas, but, uh, and we, we provided more recommendations no, no. Some of these issues are more priorities than others. As, as we came together to talk about this, some of the real priorities that we saw were increasing protections for renters in, in SRA units. And this is something that we saw coming into the downtown east side local area plan where there was a recommendation to change the way that rent control worked. Uh, we, we had another uh, key, re key recommendation, this was part of the motion from council, was about the issue of rent evictions. And we recommend in this report a way that Ontario has used to, to solve this. And we, we recommended adopting their model where you can stop people from, you can stop landlords from uh, evicting tenants uh, simply in order to try and raise the rent while retaining incentives and the ability for owners to improve their suites. And we thought that that could be a good model to try and help with this issue. And, uh, and a last pr priority that we saw coming out of this was the issue of repeated fixed term tenancies. And we've seen this come up repeatedly in the news. And, and our recommendation was that you can it might make sense to have a couple of fixed term tenancies. Uh, usually these have been annual tenancies, but we've also seen situations where this has been abused. I've seen uh, cases where landlords have said, okay, you have, a, you have a one month tenancy and we'll repeat this tenancy every month. And at the end of the month, it's up to me whether it gets renewed or not. And some, some would say that this is just up to the free market, and if you don't like that, you should move. And uh, what and what we s said ultimately is that it's important to look at the set of options that has led tenants to accept uh, these sorts of conditions. And so those were th those were three uh, particular priorities: these special protections for SRA units and dealing with reno rent evictions and these repeated fixed term tenancies that that we that I'd highlight from the report. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carr.
Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for being here. And again, please pass on my uh, thanks and appreciation to uh, the members of the committee who worked on this. My first question is, can you give us a guesstimate of the person hours involved in putting this port report together? Um, you know, uh, that... Uh, it, it, it was a it was a fair number. I, I, I spent a while at my at my parents' house uh, the, the, this past summer uh, 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 do, doing some work on this. So there were a fair a fair number. I'm, I'm guessing that that means quite a lot. Um, okay. So. Yeah, I think that sometimes we don't necessarily appreciate just how much uh, the uh, importance is of our voluntary advisory committees in terms of the, of the real work that they do. I know that the mayor is, uh, has already indicated he's planning on referring this to staff for next steps, but I'm interested if you or members of the committee talked about in your minds what you would hope uh, we would do as a council with this information. Yes, I think that, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to speak um, necessarily on behalf of everybody um, on this, but I think my my impression is that we see sort of two goals coming out of this. One is just to, that this will be a document that people can look to for suggestions, and that this can guide future motions that that you have if you're going to call for particular changes. So we we see this uh, as a document that will that will simply stand uh, as a document that. That the province and others can look to, and uh, and the second uh, and the second expectation or hope that we would have as a committee uh, would be for some uh, follow up or communication with the province uh, about this. If there are if there are particular issues that you feel relate to to um, other plans or or things that you feel are important as a city, uh, then. If, if you could communicate those directly to the province, that's, that's something we would invite you to do. Great. And do you as a committee plan to do anything in specific? Well, uh, we, we understand that there may be other things referred to us, and I, I know that a lot of uh, those on the committee are particularly interested in delving into a lot of the, the issues to do with renters that are, that are really very squarely within the jurisdiction of this council. So I think that this is the start of a conversation, but not the last word on it. Yes. I could see a lot in terms of the language, you know, protecting the um, the rights of tenants, uh, enforcing, um, mm -hmm. you know, enforcing the situation or the laws, bylaws in our case, um, regarding uh, landlords. There's there is a lot of overlap, different jurisdiction, but mm -hmm. same issue. Um, regarding the the point of um, getting tough on the lawbreakers, you use some interesting language, um, mandatory minimums. Not necessarily my mind associated with progressive thinking, <laughs> um, so I'm I'm wanting to uh, to verify. Um, first of all, these are not sentences, jail sentences you're talking about, correct? Uh, that, that that is correct. Actually, I remember when this report was being discussed. Uh, there was a call in hour about it on CKNW. Mm -hmm. The the first caller. Uh, noted uh, who was a landlord and talked about some of the difficulties that he'd had with a previous tenant who had left behind a uh, large anaconda in the in the unit and so I'll say that we, we are not recommending jail terms and we're not recommending like snakes uh, or, or anything like that uh, we good to know <laughs> okay <laughs> that's the end of my questioning but thanks very much yeah I I say we we use when we're talking about a mandatory minimum, what we're really one of the things that we're really talking about is the idea just that it should never be cheaper for a landlord to ignore the law rather than follow it. And the current regime where the where the law for how an eviction should work isn't followed, the one of the problems with that is that it's it's not designed to, um, to be. Uh, punitive. It's simply designed to compensate people for their losses, which makes a great deal of sense. But that doesn't always work well in our experience with particularly low-income tenants. If you're kicked out of your housing illegally and you don't have receipts from a hotel because instead you've become homeless, your financial losses may be very low. And 
and that's really what we were getting at, that uh, we see some unfairness there. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, before we come back to you, Councillor Stevens, we have one speaker, so uh, I'll invite him to come forward now. Thank you very much, Mr. Prost. That's all your questions. Uh, Vince uh, Federa. Welcome, Mr. Federa. You have, uh, My name is Vincent Federa. Yep, yep, Thank you, Your minutes. Honour, for having me to speak here again. It wasn't long, long ago that I was here. Different issue. This is a different issue. Uh, yeah, I just come because uh, I was just reading this article in the newspaper yesterday about this uh, committee that comes about the landlord. That I usually keep up with information from the city when it comes about rental and stuff because I'm a small-time landlord myself. And I go through all the difficult problems because I'm not a big deal uh, landlord where it screen the tenants very well and make it very difficult for low-income tenants to get in because they have so many screening and uh, bank check and all this stuff. But it, the, the article was saying, why not to ask the committee to help develop a, a workshop on good landlording? Taking the course could make landlords eligible for modest rebate on their annual house owner grant application. Landlord could also be invited to sign on to code to a code of conduct that incorporated the report suggesting that I would sign. This uh, article was written by Trisha Kelly, a very famous journalist. I think she's not here. But uh, uh, yeah, I agree with uh, uh, the problem on the downtown east side, some tenants that have really been evicted and pushed down, pushed out uh, by uh, hotels and stuff. I think this is what it's been created for. But the, the, I would advise the council to be very caref careful to make too many strict regulation where landlords, they will go through a very strict screening process where they can refuse almost everybody that wants to move from an SRO room into a basement suite or a condo and they have no good uh, credential and then they could be faced with more uh, uh, homeless, being more homeless rather than just find a better place in the downtown east sides. Also I want to advise the council that they should thank all the people that run those SRO downtown which mostly they are ethnic like me, a different nationality, and they put up with all those uh, problems that those uh, homeless people create, destroying the property and stuff like that. So I would advise the council they should first thank those people that they don't come here to City Hall uh, describing their problems, uh, which there are very few numbers of uh, big problem, instead of just uh, take the advice from the those people are here, right? <laughs> That's all I want to say. Thank you. Any questions? No, thanks very much. There are no questions, but thank you for coming today. So, uh, Mayor Robertson, do you want to lay down the next step here? Yeah, I've uh, advanced a some language, a motion for um, next steps on this one to the clerks, which we should get on screens. Basically, it states that council thank the Renters Advisory Committee for their work, accept the report and direct staff to review the recommendations and report back on next steps for advocacy as part of an update to the city's work to better protect renters. Uh, pretty basic language for next steps. I think we've got a, a great report to work with here, um, but uh, would benefit immensely from our uh, incredible staff taking a look at it and uh, helping advise us on our next steps on advocacy. We've done lots of advocacy on. Uh, on the Rental Tenancy Act and changes that we'd like to see, um, but I think we can certainly refine that based on the expertise from our Renters Advisory Committee and uh, the work that they've done to pull together uh, these recommendations. So we'll, uh, I'd like to have the staff's uh, report back on that in the near term and we can take some next steps from there. And uh, thanks to staff in advance for uh, for taking this on. I know it's near and dear to your hearts and uh, lots of work has already taken place. So that combination of the advisory committee's recommendation and staff's expertise uh, should be potent in the uh, response that we get. 
Okay, it's quite straightforward. I don't see any speakers, so unless someone uh, really wants to speak to this, we will move to the voting queue. And uh, councillors, please uh, show your vote. And that passes uh, unanimously. Thanks very much. And thank you, Mr. Prost, to your whole committee for a really terrific job. And that leaves us with our last item, Multimaterial BC. Councillor Affleck, yes, uh, you're withdrawing due to a conflict of interest. Thank you very much. Do you have a presentation, Mr. Dobrovolny? Uh, we have a presentation, but I, I know that council is running late, so I'll leave it to council if you'd like to see the presentation or if you'd like us quite up to, to skip it. Is there anyone who wants to see the presentation? Okay, not seeing it. Looks like you're off the hook, Mr. Dobrovolny. So, um, the, uh, any questions to staff? You're still there, Mayor Roberts. Oh, we've got a speaker too. So, any questions to staff? You, you did you you're still for there from the last time, eh? Yeah, left over. Yeah, okay. Uh, Councillor Carr, you have a question for staff? I, I do. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Dobroni. Um My first question has to do with the um, the level of service. Now, in my understanding, in reading the report, that there there was a there's there was consideration around whether or not switching the um, the service to being um, done by Multimaterials BC would achieve the same standards that we have set in the city under our Greener City Action Plan. So I'm just looking for affirmation from you. It appears that that's the case, that um, that we have confidence, and maybe on what basis we've got confidence that MMBC can um, achieve the same levels of diversion and, and service around, um, around our recycling. Yeah, absolutely, the same or better. Um, we've had uh, conversations already with MMBC and we both share the common goal uh, to be sure that we, in this transition um, that we would maintain the high levels of service and continue to improve uh, those level of service as time goes on. Okay. Um, I, I had a very specific question. Um, in the report it says that there will be no... Um, that. Um, there will be no residential recycling on Musqueam Reserve. What's the alternative for those who live on the Musqueam Reserve? Yeah, so right now um, we provide those services uh, to Musqueam. And so as we're recommending to um, turn that over to MMBC, uh, the recommendation is we give Musqueam lots of notice that they can then make alternate arrangements, either um, you know, work with MMBC or look at other options. But we'll give them lots of notice that during this one-year transition that they can also make arrangements um, to their satisfaction. Okay, and we're confident that that can happen, that there's yes. lots of yes. opportunities. To... Yes, and we be, they, we've begun discussions and we'll continue. And, the, and we've been in discussion with Yes, the... absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Reimer. Hi. Um, questions about, sorry, I'm just going to get the right report in front of me here. Uh, item D about talking to the um, Minister of Environment. Um, Am I right on that, that it's D? Sorry, I have way too many windows open. Uh, yes, so recommendation D around Ministry of the Environment. Um, one of my big concerns through this whole process is the ability to maintain, um, you know, very hard fought gains in terms of service level and recycling rates and our staff do have done a really amazing job, particularly over this last six years with the transition to more aggressive diversion rates. So can you speak a bit to what we would anticipate from the Minister of Environment in that regard? Yes, yeah, so the intent was that we would um, keep the ministry as well, uh, involve the ministry in our discussions as well as MMBC. MMBC, you know, is, is a, a creature of the uh, provincial government. They have um, uh, standards and targets that they need to meet. They've they've been meeting those, and those those standards and targets um, fit well with our uh, greenest city objectives as well. Um, but we want to include the uh, provincial government, the ministry, and as well as uh, the MMBC staff um, moving forward. So we have some, I don't know, if confidence is the right word. We think that it's possible that the minister will. Um, provide a greater level of assurance to us around um, 
mechanisms by which we can ensure those service levels and recycling rates are continued to be met by MMBC? Yes, well, ministry staff have been involved in, in the discussions we've been having so far, and we'll continue those as well. Um, but again, um, the, the discussions we've had with MMBC, um, you know, we're fully aligned on, on um, what we hope to achieve and our goals moving forward, and the ministry staff will also help to buttress that as well. Okay, I'm more, I, I appreciate it. I know it's been a ton of work. At the same time, um, I can't take the full alignment we might verbally have with them today um, to a future court to enforce yeah. um, concerns we might have around regulations or diversion rates. Um, second question was, uh, and I'm sorry, I really did want to thank the Renters Advisory Committee in person, so I'm sorry I missed the, the first uh, question Councillor Carr might have asked. There's been some confusion about who's contracting who and why why that is. So can you just flesh that out for us? Sure, and it, and it, it isn't intuitive, so I'll, I'll walk through it step by step. So in 2013 and 2014, um, Multi-Material BC was created, and, and their mandate included the responsibility for residential recycling across the province. And so they became responsible for providing the service. Uh, we chose, the City of Vancouver chose at that time to continue to pick up uh, residential recycling in much of the city. There's a portion, the downtown core, uh, that we contract out. So we became a contractor to MMBC um, because they had responsibility for it. They paid the, the city funding uh, for us to pick it up um, as a contractor to them. And what we're recommending today is that we no longer um, act as the contractor to MMBC and we um, cancel the contract and have them now be responsible for uh, the collection of residential recycling. So it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. I cannot think of another situation in which the city is a contractor to an external agency. Yeah, I can't think of one for a core service such as this. Okay, so either. it's extremely unusual, if not unique, circumstance. Yeah, and, and it goes back to the producer pay model and the, the creation of, uh, of MMBC to fit within that producer pay model. Okay, and then um, last but definitely not least is um, staff transition. Uh, so the intention, um, you know, we, we have a increasing number of people who are choosing to litter in the city and abandon waste. So mm -hmm. the intention is to, uh, that staffing would move into that area to deal with urgent needs there. Yes, we have a tremendous need. We've seen an increase in, in litter on the street. We've seen an increase in litter in the cans. We've seen an increase in abandoned waste throughout the city. And, um, and it, it's been a, a, a tremendous problem over the last year or two as it's been growing. And so this provides us an opportunity to transition that staff over to deal with this um, problem that we face um, and ha uh, continue the high level of recycling services uh, that the residents will receive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Emmer. Councillor Ball? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just wondering about the sort of the basics of, of who the our public are going to talk to if they're happy or not happy with the service they now phone 311 or they send us letters or what what is the process and and how many different processes are there going to be uh, because I understand at least from my reading that there will be the MMBC action there'll be a separate glass collection and then there will be our garbage basically um, if I'm wrong, please correct me, but if you could fill us in as to how the public will communicate what they need. So th there will be three um, pickups. There will be a green waste pickup, there will be a garbage pickup, and there will be a recycling pickup. And within the recycling pickup, there will, it will include glass. So glass will be part of the recycling pickup. Um, we're currently rolling out the glass um, over the next few months with city staff. But when it transitions, if council approves the recommendations and it transitions over to MMBC, they would inherit not only the recycling, but the glass as part of that as well. Um, prob you touched on what is probably the most important piece of communication, uh, public information that we need to get out, is that the fact 
um, that there would be a new contact number uh, for um, complaints related to uh, recycling. Um, for the most part, the residents shouldn't see a difference. There will be a different color truck that comes by and picks up their recycling likely on the same day. Um, but if there's a problem with the service, then there would be a call center created um, that MMBC would uh, manage, be responsible for, or their contractor would be responsible for. And um, so that's one of the key pieces of information we have to get out to the public is that this change is taking place, so they understand that. But most importantly, there would be a new, uh, a new number. And, uh, and what we've seen from other cities is there's a transition period of time where, uh, where people are calling both numbers. And so 311 would still accept those calls and forward them. Um, but the goal would then to be make the uh, residents aware, our citizens aware, uh, that there would be this new number to call uh, related to recycling. Thank you, because I think that will be very important. As yes. I, we all know that it's important to receive that information. Will we keep track of that information or, over the first yeah, period and, of time? And, and that's part of the reporting. We, we want to, as I said, both MMBC and the city are committed to having this transition be successful, having the high level of service maintained and improved. And so part of that will be looking at um, reporting out regarding the amount that's um, collected and the, the volumes that are collected and also part of that will be looking at customer service levels and complaints and so that would be all part of the reporting that we would want to be uh, aware of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no further questions, I presume you've got a motion, Councillor Reimer. Why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Uh, I will move the recommendations in the report with an addition which I forwarded to the clerk. So um, I have to say I don't often find myself in the strange situation of moving a motion that I don't like, uh, but that is the best available option to me. I sometimes remark that I miss working for an activist organization where I was right all the time. I never had to deal with these morally challenging <laughs> issues. Um, you know. Per um, Mr. Dubravoni's points, this is predicated by a decision um, the province made to take away the statutory authority for recycling from the cities and give it to MMBC. I really apologize, Councillor Reimer. I, I just realized I forgot to ask whether Louise Schwartz was present. As well. Oh, geez, right. So I haven't seen her today. She's not. Is Ms. Schwartz Louise here? Ms. Schwartz is listed. No, I, as I don't a... see her. I apologize for the interruption, but I uh, didn't want it's to. It's okay. That. That's an important one. Okay. Sorry. Carry on. Um, so to say that um, the, the impetus for all of this was a decision by the province, I know council is very familiar with this because we have gone around this bend many, many times, um, but that to say even more morally ambiguous is that um, I believe in the principle of extended producer responsibility. So this whole thing is predicated by a policy and principle I agree with, but um, an implementation that I have greatly struggled with in its practical reality. We have seen such phenomenal achievements from our staff on the front lines in solid waste um, on both service delivery. One of the most common complaints I got in 2008, I, I got an FOI that wanted every email that had been sent to me over a period of time, and I'd say 80% of them were waste complaints. Um, and to see now, I can't remember the last time I got a complaint on pickup, and to see diversion move almost 20%, or okay, let's call it 15, but still a pretty significant um, chunk of movement over a six-year period. Um, to give up control of that is a very challenging position um, to be in, but really with MMBC um, providing us with the options available to us, um, this is the best preferable course of action at this point. I, I really wanted to acknowledge that um, staff um, in engineering, Mr. Dubravoni, Mr. Shamus, and the crew have gone to great lengths to find ways to ensure to the best of our abilities that there will be mandatory information disclosure, that we will have the legislative tools that we need to ensure service levels maintain or increase for our residents, and that we continue to make the progress that we expect on our environmental objectives. Um, and I also wanted to thank frontline staff, though. I, I this isn't, If this isn't easy for me, I'm sure it's a much harder um, discussion and, and moment for them. Um, I think their willingness to work on a transition strategy has been quite um, quite appreciated. And, and it's, there is this very 
clear and real need to increase um, service around abandoned waste and litter and the increasing challenges there. And per the the amendment um, speaks to that, that I wanted to make sure that in this period of transition we are focused very clearly on that need and also that it, it's well articulated so that at some future date we're not, there's no um, concern that we thought we understood what we were moving into, but it wasn't clearly written down. So that's why I provide it today as part of the amendment process. Thanks. Okay. Uh, seeing no further speakers, so I will uh, propose we go to the vote on this. So uh, the recommendations in the report as amended by Councillor Reimer, please uh, vote. Okay, and that passes uh, unanimously uh, with uh, three absent, but that's uh, it for that motion. So thank you very much and thanks to staff. It was a very complicated and difficult analysis and one where they worked closely, I know, with our, uh, with our unions. So uh, you're going to do the honours, Councillor Reimer. We just have one leave of absence to do under this uh, section as well for Councillor Louis. So. So that concludes the uh, standing committee portion. We'll convene a regular council. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, we now convene a regular council to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's standing committee on city finance and services. Madam Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Mayor Robinson is not in the chamber. Uh, Councillor Louis is on leave of absence for civic business. Councillor Stevenson? Here. Councillor Deal? Here. Councillor Jang? Here. Councillor Reimer is in the chair. Councillor Meggs? Here. Councillor Ball? Councillor Affleck is out of the room. Councillor Carr. Councillor DiGenova. You have a quorum, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much. We need a motion to adopt the Standing Committee's recommendations. So moved. Councillor Deal, seconded by Councillor Ball. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion is carried unanimously. We do have, as noted, one piece of urgent business, uh, which is a leave of absence for civic business for Councillor Louis. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Uh, for the record, it's for meetings held on November 24th, 2015. We've got uh, Councillor Ball and Councillor Deal moving and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion is carried unanimously. We need a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Councillor Deal. Seconded by Councillor Jang. Motion, any objection? Motion is carried unanimously. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for the abbreviated Council Day. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs>